Chapter Six of A Witch Shall Be Born by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six The Vulture's Wings. It was the smoky light of a torch which roused Taramis, Queen of Khauran, from the slumber in which she sought forgetfulness. Lifting herself on her hand, she raked back her tangled hair and blinked up, expecting to meet the mocking countenance of Salome, malign with new torments. Instead, a cry of pity and horror reached her ears. Taramis, oh, my queen! The sound was so strange to her ears that she thought she was still dreaming. Behind the torch she could make out figures now, the glint of steel, then five countenances bent toward her, not swarthy and hook-nosed, but lean, aquiline faces, browned by the sun. She crouched in her tatters, staring wildly. One of the figures sprang forward and fell on one knee before her, arms stretched appealingly toward her. Oh, Taramis, thank Ishtar we have found you. Do you not remember me, Valerius? Once with your own lips you praised me after the battle of Carveca. Valerius, she stammered. Suddenly tears welled into her eyes. Oh, I dream. It is some magic of Salome's to torment me. No, the cry rang with exultation. It is your own true vassals come to rescue you. Yet we must hasten. Constantius fights in the plain against Conan, who has brought the Zoagirs across the river. But three hundred Shemites yet hold the city. We slew the jailer and took his keys, and have seen no other guards. But we must be gone. Come. The queen's legs gave way, not from weakness, but from the reaction. Valerius lifted her like a child, and, with the torch-bearer hurrying before them, they left the dungeon and went up a slimy stone stair. It seemed to mount endlessly, but presently they emerged into a corridor. They were passing a dark arch when the torch was suddenly struck out, and the bearer cried out in fierce brief agony. A burst of blue fire glared in the dark corridor in which the furious face of Salome was limbed momentarily, with a beast-like figure crouching beside her. Then the eyes of the watchers were blinded by that blaze. Valerius tried to stagger along the corridor with the queen. Dazedly he heard the sound of murderous blows driven deep in flesh, accompanied by gasps of death and a bestial grunting. Then the queen was torn brutally from his arms, and a savage blow on his helmet dashed him to the floor. Grimly he crawled to his feet, shaking his head in an effort to rid himself of the blue flame which still seemed to dance devilishly before him. When his blinded sight cleared, he found himself alone in the corridor alone except for the dead. His four companions lay in their blood, heads and bosoms cleft and gashed. Blinded and dazed in that hell-born glare, they had died without any opportunity of defending themselves. The queen was gone. With a bitter curse, Valerius caught up his sword, tearing his cleft helmet from his head to clatter on the flags. Blood ran down his cheek from a cut in his scalp. Reeling, frantic with indecision, he heard a voice calling his name in desperate urgency. Valerius! Valerius! He staggered in the direction of the voice, and rounded a corner just in time to have his arms filled with a soft, supple figure which flung itself frantically at him. Eva, are you mad? I had to come, she sobbed. I followed you, hid in an arch of the outer court. A moment ago I saw her emerge with a brute who carried a woman in his arms. I knew it was Taramis, and that you had failed. Oh, but you are hurt. Hey, Scratch. He put aside her clinging arms. Quick, Ivga, tell me which way they went. They fled across the square toward the temple. He paled. 
Ishtar! Oh, the fiend! She means to give Taramis to the devil she worships. Quick, Ivga! Run to the south wall where the people watch the battle. Tell them that their real queen has been found, that the impostor has dragged her to the temple. Go! Sobbing, the girl sped away, her light sandals pattering on the cobblestones, and Valerius raced across the court, plunged into the street, dashed into the square upon which it debouched, and ran for the great structure that rose on the opposite side. His flying feet spurned the marble as he darted up the broad stair and through the pillared portico. Evidently their prisoner had given them some trouble. Taramis, sensing the doom intended for her, was fighting against it with all the strength of her splendid young body. Once she had broken away from the brutish priest, only to be dragged down again. The group was halfway down the broad nave, at the other end of which stood the grim altar, and beyond that the great metal door, obscenely carven, through which many had gone, but from which only Salome had ever emerged. Taramis's breath came in panting gasps. Her tattered garment had been torn from her in the struggle. She writhed in the grasp of her apish captor like a white naked nymph in the arms of a satyr. Salome watched cynically, though impatiently, moving toward the carven door, and from the dusk that lurked along the lofty walls the obscene gods and gargoyles leered down, as if imbued with salacious life. Choking with fury, Valerius rushed down the great hall, sword in hand. At a sharp cry from Salome, the skull-faced priest looked up, then released Taramis, drew a heavy knife, already smeared with blood, and ran at the oncoming Karanai. But cutting down men blinded by the devil's flame loosed by Salome was different from fighting a wiry young Hyborian afire with hate and rage. Up went the dripping knife, but before it could fall, Valerius's keen, narrow blade slashed through the air, and the fist that held the knife jumped from its wrist in a shower of blood. Valerius, berserk, slashed again and yet again before the crumpling figure could fall. The blade licked through flesh and bone. The skull-like head fell one way, the half-sundered torso the other. Valerius whirled on his toes, quick and fierce as a jungle cat, glaring about for Salome. She must have exhausted her fire dust in the prison. She was bending over Taramis, grasping her sister's black locks in one hand, and in the other lifting a dagger. Then, with a fierce cry, Valerius's sword was sheathed in her breast with such fury that the point sprang out between her shoulders. With an awful shriek, the witch sank down, writhing in convulsions, grasping at the naked blade as it was withdrawn, smoking and dripping. Her eyes were inhuman. With a more than human vitality she clung to the life that ebbed through the wound that split the crimson crescent on her ivory bosom. She groveled on the floor clawing and biting at the naked stones in her agony. Sickened at the sight, Valeria stooped and lifted the half-fainting queen. Turning his back on the twisting figure on the floor, he ran toward the door, stumbling in his haste. He staggered out upon the portico, halted at the head of the steps. The square thronged with people. Some had come at Ivka's incoherent cries, Others had deserted the walls in fear of the on-sweeping hordes out of the desert, fleeing unreasonably toward the center of the city. Dumb resignation had vanished. The throng seethed and milled, yelling and screaming. About the road there sounded somewhere the splintering of stone and timbers. A band of grim Shemites cleft the crowd, the guards of the northern gates, hurrying toward the south gate to reinforce their comrades there. They reined up short 
at the sight of the youth on the steps, holding the limp, naked figure in his arms. The heads of the throng turned toward the temple. The crowd gaped. A new bewilderment added to their swirling confusion. "'Here is your queen!' yelled Valerius, straining to make himself understood above the clamor. The people gave back a bewildered roar. They did not understand, and Valerius sought in vain to lift his voice above their bedlam. The Shemites rode toward the temple steps, beating a way through the crowd with their spears. Then a new, grisly element introduced itself into the frenzy. Out of the gloom of the temple behind Valerius wavered a slim white figure, laced with crimson. The people screamed. There, in the arms of Valerius, hung the woman they thought their queen, yet there in the temple door staggered another figure, like a reflection of the other. Their brains reeled. Valerius felt his blood congeal as he stared at the swaying witch-girl. His sword had transfixed her, sundered her heart. She should be dead. By all laws of nature she should be dead. Yet there she swayed on her feet, clinging horribly to life. Fog! she screamed, reeling in the doorway. Fog! As an answer to that frightful invocation, there boomed a thunderous croaking from within the temple, the snapping of wood and metal. "'That is the queen!' roared the captain of the Shemites, lifting his bow. "'Shoot down the man and the other woman!' But the roar of a roused hunting pack rose from the people. They had guessed the truth at last, understood Valerius's frenzied appeals, knew that the girl who hung limply in his arms was their true queen. With a soul-shaking yell, they surged on the Shemites, tearing and smiting with tooth and nail and naked hands, with the desperation of hard-pent fury loosed at last. Above them, Salome swayed and tumbled down the marble stairs, dead at last. Arrows flickered about him as Valerius ran back between the pillars of the portico, shielding the body of the queen with his own. Shooting and slashing ruthlessly, the mounted Shemites were holding their own with the maddened crowd. Valerius darted to the temple door. With one foot on the threshold, he recoiled, crying out in horror and despair. Out of the gloom at the other end of the great hall, a vast dark form heaved up, came rushing toward him in gigantic, frog-like hops. He saw the gleam of great unearthly eyes, the shimmering of fangs and talons. He fell back from the door, and then the whir of a shaft past his ear warned him that death was also behind him. He wheeled desperately. Four or five Shemites had cut their way through the throng, and were spurring their horses up the steps, their bows lifted to shoot him down. He sprang behind a pillar, on which the arrows splintered. Taramis had fainted. She hung like a dead woman in his arms. Before the Shemites could loose again, the doorway was blocked by a gigantic shape. With affrightened yells, the mercenaries wheeled and began beating a frantic way through the throng, which crushed back in sudden, galvanized horror, trampling one another in their stampede. But the monster seemed to be watching Valerius and the girl. Squeezing its vast, unstable bulk through the door, it bounded toward him as he ran down the steps. He felt it looming behind him, a giant shadowy thing, like a travesty of nature cut out of the heart of night, a black shapelessness in which only the staring eyes and gleaming fangs were distinct. Then came a sudden thunder of hoofs. A rout of Shemites, bloody and battered, streamed across the square from the south, plowing blindly through the packed throng. Behind them swept a horde of horsemen yelling in a familiar tongue, waving red swords. The exiles returned. <laughs>
With them rode fifty black-bearded desert riders, and at their head a giant figure in black mail. "'Conan!' shrieked Valerius. "'Conan!' The giant yelled a command. Without checking their headlong pace, the desert men lifted their bows, drew, and loosed. A cloud of arrows sang across the square, over the seething heads of the multitudes, and sank feather-deep in the black monster. It halted, wavered, reared, a black blot against the marble pillars. Again the sharp clouds sang, and yet again, and the horror collapsed and rolled down the steps, as dead as the witch who had summoned it out of the night of ages. Conan drew rein beside the portico, leaped off. Valerius had laid the queen on the marble, sinking beside her in utter exhaustion. The people surged about, crowding in. The Cimmerian cursed them back, lifted her dark head, pillowed it against his mailed shoulder. "'By Crom, what is this? The real Taramis! But who is that yonder?' "'The demon who wore her shape,' panted Valerius. Conan swore heartily. Ripping a cloak from the shoulders of a soldier, he wrapped it about the naked queen. Her long, dark lashes quivered on her cheeks. Her eyes opened, stared up unbelievingly into the Cimmerian's scarred face. Conan! Her soft fingers caught at him. Do I dream? She told me you were dead. Scarcely, he grinned hardly. You do not dream. You are queen of Koran again. I broke Constantius out there by the river. Most of his dogs never lived to reach the walls, for I gave orders that no prisoners be taken except Constantius. The city guard closed the gate in our faces, but we burst in with rams swung from our saddles. I left all my wolves outside except this fifty. I didn't trust them in here, and these Karani lads were enough for the gate guards. It has been a nightmare, she whimpered. Oh, my poor people! You must help me try to repay them for all they have suffered. Conan, henceforth counselor as well as captain. Conan laughed but shook his head. Rising, he set the queen upon her feet and beckoned to a number of his Koronai horsemen who had not continued the pursuit of the fleeing Shemites. They sprang from their horses, eager to do the bidding of their new-found queen. No, lass, that's all over with. I'm chief of the Zuagirs now, and must lead them to plunder the Turanians, as I promised. This lad, Valerius, will make you a better captain than I. I wasn't made to dwell among marble walls anyway. But I must leave you now and complete what I've begun. She might still live in Koran. As Valerius started to follow Taramis across the square toward the palace, through a lane opened by the wildly cheering multitude, he felt a soft hand slipped timidly into his sinewy fingers and turned to receive the slender body of Ivga in his arms. He crushed her to him and drank her kisses with the gratitude of a weary fighter who has attained rest at last through tribulation and storm. But not all men seek rest and peace. Some are born with the spirit of the storm in their blood, restless harbingers of violence and bloodshed, knowing no other path. The sun was rising. The ancient caravan road was thronged with white-robed horsemen in a wavering line that stretched from the walls of Koran to a spot far out in the plains. Conan the Cimmerian sat at the head of that column, near the jagged end of a wooden beam that stuck up out of the ground. Near that stump rose a heavy cross, and on that cross a man hung by spikes through his hands and feet. Seven months ago, Constantius, said Conan, it was I who hung there, and you who sat here. Constantius did not reply. He licked his gray lips, and his eyes were glassy with pain and fear. Muscles writhed like cords along his lean body. 
"'You are more fit to inflict torture than to endure it,' said Conan tranquilly. "'I hung there on a cross as you are hanging, and I lived, thanks to circumstances and a stamina peculiar to barbarians. But you civilized men are soft. Your lives are not nailed to your spines as are ours. Your fortitude consists mainly in inflicting torment, not in enduring it. You will be dead before sundown. And so, falcon of the desert, I leave you to the companionship of another bird of the desert. He gestured toward the vultures, whose shadows swept across the sands as they wheeled overhead. From the lips of Constantius came an inhuman cry of despair and horror. Conan lifted his reins and rode toward the river that shone like silver in the morning sun. Behind him the white-clad riders struck into a trot. The gaze of each, as he passed a certain spot, turned impersonally and with the desert man's lack of compassion toward the cross and the gaunt figure that hung there, black against the sunrise. Their horses' hoofs beat out a knell in the dust. Lower and lower swept the wings of the hungry vultures. End of chapter 6 End of A Witch Shall Be Born by Robert E. Howard this book was read with great enjoyment by Phil Chenever in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in June of 2013.